Well, we are so glad that you could join with us. Welcome to Oak Bend Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thanks for sharing life with us as we worship together. Uh, we typically start off with a couple of announcements, and we have those as well today. Just a final reminder that we do have the men's retreat next weekend coming up here real soon. It's going to be just down the street. Uh, we're going to join together with Grace Church and a couple other churches and worship God together as men. So we're going to send out a final email uh, early this week to let you know if, here's, how, here's how you sign up in case you missed it. Um, that'll start uh, Friday night and it'll go into go home, stay at your own house, come back and finish up Saturday early afternoon. So we look forward to seeing you there. I know um, some of you guys have said you've signed up already. So I'm excited to see you there. And if you haven't, uh, there is still time to sign up this week. So thanks for doing that. We do have the talent show coming up on March 11th and everyone is invited. Um, the main event will be the, ta uh, the talent show, but it's also going to have an Italian dinner. It sounds exciting. Uh, and concluding with games and fellowship, there is now a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board right here in the sanctuary. Go ahead and check it out. We would love to see you if you're able to make it that time as well. And just a final reminder, this isn't going to be on the slides, but for those of you that are Lighthouse students for our Sunday night youth group, um, we are going to give the blankets away that we made back in December. That's going to happen today. So if you want to be a part of that, show up to church a little bit early tonight at 430. We're going to leave here go to the Perrysburg Manor and drop those off and bless them with those blankets. And so thank you all for being involved in the, in the making of those as well. And, um, and then we're going to come back here as a youth group and have a, a pizza dinner and uh, our normal lighthouse from 6 to 8. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace and for your truth that we need in these trying times. Father, we come uh, sometimes to church on a Sunday and our weeks have been um, either a letdown or difficult times, something that we're really struggling with, uh, maybe many things. With so much going on around us and the immediate need of our families, sometimes it's hard to see you at work. And so we're here this morning to say, Lord, have your way. Guide us in your truth and by your spirit. Lord, have your way in this place this morning. We look up to you, Jesus Christ, our Savior. It is in your great name we pray. Amen. Let's let God have his way this morning as we praise and worship our King.
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. the only one who could ever say worthy worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Love to those 
We thank you that even if we are shaking, you are still firm and nothing will fall off that is found in you. Only the things that need to be shaken off will be shaken. Lord, we need you. We thank you. We bless your name for being God Almighty. As the kids prepare to leave, Lord, we ask that you fill them up, Lord God, that you fill up their teachers, that you give them what they need today to be closer to you, um, plant seeds, let them be watered so that they can huh, so that they can learn to know you, learn to trust you, learn to serve you, learn to love you and love you more. And Father God, as we, your adult children, need to do the same, we ask that you bless Pastor Daniels as he prepares to give the word, that our hearts are ready to receive it. Um, Lord, let it convict us to repentance and help us to just be steadfast um, in you, our firm foundation. Amen. Okay. Good morning. Let me welcome you to Oak Bend Church today. If you happen to be a guest this morning, if it's your first time, we are so glad that you are with us. Uh, we are currently making our way through the book of Daniel. We've just started into it. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd encourage you to take those and turn to chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. That uh, we start with a picture this morning, so uh, I think we have a picture here to put up. Oh, there it is. I can't. There it is. Okay. Uh, some of you may, few of you might know what this is. It's an original picture of a place in our country where, in 1848, an event started that's gone down in American history. Um, if you've lived in California. I think a few of you have, this is where you're from, then you may know this place or you've been there. This is Sutter's Mill. Um, and in 1848, a man by the name of James Marshall was actually building Sutter's Mill when he found something known as gold. And yes, you see the man in the picture. I have no idea who that is. It might be Mr. Marshall or it just might be somebody that got in the picture. I don't really know. Um, I'm pretty sure he would have liked to have kept the discovery to himself, uh, but it didn't work that way. It got out pretty quickly, not just in California, but it spread across the nation. And uh, pretty soon, several hundred thousand people were pouring in to California for what became known as the California Gold Rush. Uh, many of them, upon their arrival, would actually go out to the riverbeds, they would go to the rock quarries, and of course, remember, many of these people were not prospectors, they didn't know much about prospecting for anything, so they would go out to these places and they would look for these clusters of uh, gold specks that they would be able to see in the riverbed or in the rock quarry, and when they would see that, they would think, surely there's gold there, and so they would hurry in and they would stake their claim and sometimes they would give basically everything they had came with to buy off their claim. Uh, but as the old saying goes, not everything that glitters is gold. And uh, a lot of these people found that out. Uh, they spent a lot of time digging out these clusters of gold. They were sure they were worth a lot for everything that they had poured into it only to find that when they took them in to be weighed and measured and checked, uh, they turned out to be absolutely and completely worthless. So was their entire claim. These things looked like gold. They shined like gold. Sometimes they even felt the weight of gold, but they weren't gold. They were something that we know today as iron pyrite or what's more become known as a fool's gold. And it lacked the value it lacked the importance, it lacked the worth of the real thing. Now, what happened to those people in California 
back in 1848 and the years that followed can actually happen to people today. And it does happen to people today. There is a tendency uh, for us to not always know the value of things. There is this tendency for us to become confused about what's important and what's lasting. And the events that we're going to find this morning in Daniel chapter 2 are meant to speak to that. Uh, They are events that happened first to a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, but they were events that were meant to cause him, as they are to cause us, to consider how well we're discerning what's really important in life. What it is that we're really giving our energies and our efforts to Are we just dealing with the immediate, or are we dealing with the important? Have we put everything into just what's temporal, or are we putting anything into what's eternal? Now, if you have by some means read ahead this morning in Daniel, you're going to know that Daniel is an incredibly, uh, Daniel 2 is an incredibly long chapter. It is 49 verses. It's the longest chapter in the book of Daniel. Um, And just to put you at ease right now, we are not going to cover all 49 verses, but we are going to cover the whole chapter because the chapter is really, I don't think, divisible. Some of the chapters in Daniel, we can divide them up and we can talk about a couple of different things. This is not one of them because it really is a single story. It's a single literary unit and it has a really a single message that comes out of that story. And so we need to deal with it uh, as a whole chapter. So here's what we're going to do this morning, or I'm going to do this morning. Uh, I am going to deal selectively with the verses in Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to do that in some other places in Daniel. If you have not read Daniel 2 and you want to get every little detail, then go home today and read it. Uh, but we're going to deal with enough of the verses this morning that we are going to get uh, the full flow of the story and the challenges that it is meant to bring to you and me today. So with that, let's pick up at Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to pick up at verse 1. It says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I've firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned in to piles of of rubble. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is somewhere in his second or third year of reign. Here it says the second. There's two ways of counting his reign. He's probably counting it the Babylonian way, which gives him two. If you count it a Judean, it gives him three. But he's just into his reign a couple years. He has this set of dreams that are troubling him, and he calls in these soothsayers, magicians, sorcerers, all of these people that Uh, read the stars and read the entrails of animals and uh, read the movements uh, in in cups and all to to tell you what things meant. And by the way, Daniel was a part of that class of people that were better known as wise men. So Daniel had learned many of those things. Uh, Most likely, it appears Daniel isn't there. Uh, We'll find out just a little later in the chapter that Daniel is actually at his residence when Everything comes down from the fallout of this dream. Uh, So he's not there. And it may be that he wasn't there because the king either hadn't summoned him or he's just finishing up the training that we read about last week in chapter 1. And so he isn't, in a sense, on the docket yet. Okay, and so he's not there, but he is a wise man. And the king calls in these so-called wise guys and says, look, I've got a dream, and I need you to interpret it. But I don't want you just to interpret it. I want you to tell me what the dream is, and then you can interpret it. And of course, they start to lose it. Uh, But the king, yeah, yeah, the king, and now this is my take on it. The Bible doesn't tell us, so you can see it the other way, and you may be right. 
I think the king knew what the dream was because there's some things later in the text that give us a sense that he knew what he had dreamed because he was highly agitated by it. He just doesn't know what it means. But he's also a guy that's been around long enough to figure out that particularly when you're in a place of power, there's people that will be glad to tell you anything you want to hear. And maybe some of you, you work in a place and you're kind of up the ladder and you've got people that report to you and there's some people who just brown nose you to death. They'll tell you anything you want to hear. And he doesn't want to just hear anything. He wants to hear truth at this point. And so he figures if you can interpret the dream and tell me what it is, surely then you know uh, how to give me the right interpretation of it. By the way, just a little side note here. Uh, is there anybody in your life that can actually tell you the truth and tell you when you're wrong? Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was not very good at being told wrong. One of the beauties of the life of Daniel with this king is uh, Daniel always speaks to him truth, whether he likes it or not. He just does it in a tactful, wise way. Is anybody able to speak truth into your life? Look at you and tell you sometimes you are wrong and you need to do different. You know, there's a proverb that says, the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And the wounds of a friend are faithful. We all need somebody in our lives that can look at us and tell us sometimes, this is what you need to hear. It's probably not what you want to hear. And so the king here makes this firm decision that you can either tell me what my dream is, or it's going to be a really bad day for all of you because I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to just take your house and, and make it a pile of rubble. Look at verse 10. It says, The astrologers answered the king, and they are right about this, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among the humans. This is a nice way of telling the king what you're asking is so unreasonable. Nobody has ever asked this of anybody who has served a king. And no man can answer this. And he's right. No man can. But did you catch verse 11? Verse 11, they even tell him, they said, no one can reveal it to the king except the gods and they don't live among the humans. In other words, listen, the gods may know it, But the gods don't tell it. At least our gods don't tell it, king. And if you know anything about the uh, gods of the Babylonians, they were like a lot of gods of the ancient world. They were pretty fickled uh, about whether or not they would interact with humans or help humans. You never really knew where they were, what they would be like from day to day. Which, by the way, uh, this is one of the things that makes Christianity unique out of world religions. And that is that we have a God who is transcendent which means we have a God who enters into human affairs. He actually connects with humans. He speaks to humans. He reveals himself to humans. And what makes Christianity unique among all religions is the fact that God has uh, communicated himself in the most unique way, and that is he has become one of us in the person of Jesus. He has become human, lived among us, known what life is like as a human, suffered, and then rose from the dead for us. And that makes Christianity unique among all the religions and beliefs of the world. Now, their inability is seen by the king as deception. And so in his anger, he orders the execution of all the wise men, which will include Daniel and his friends. Look at verse 14 says, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so they might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house, and he explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Uh, A couple things here. Daniel's human enough to not want to be executed, and yet he's in touch with God enough that when the bottom begins to fall out of his life, he doesn't fall apart. I mean, if you can for a moment, and I know this is hard, try to think about if you're in Daniel's shoes and the knock comes on your door, and when you open the door, the guy on the other side of it looks at you and says, uh, yeah, I've, I've come to take you to your execution. How would you feel? Oh, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to like it. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't want to be executed. Daniel didn't. But it's interesting to me that Daniel does not fall apart. He doesn't come unglued. He doesn't start thinking about how unfair God is and how things just are not working out. And I've done all this and I've been honorable to God. He doesn't do that. He doesn't come apart. And here's why I think Daniel doesn't come apart. He doesn't come apart because Daniel is rooted in some things that are lasting, which is really is what is at the heart of this chapter. It's to get us to think about where we're rooted. Is it in something that's lasting or something that's passing? Something that's temporary? or something that's eternal, something that's actually worth something, or something that's only of momentary value. And Daniel is rooted in what lasts. And so when he comes up against this, while he doesn't want to be executed, he's not falling apart. And by the way, do you notice how he reacts to someone that's opposing him? Two words there. We really need to put them to use in our culture today. Wisdom and tact. We need those in our culture today. The best answer to a culture that you feel is against you is not anger. It's wisdom and tact. Wisdom is God-given understanding to know how to deal with people and how to deal with a situation. And that comes by being close to God and spending time with God like Daniel did. And tact, that's just a nice word for quit being rude. Daniel was not rude. Daniel was gracious in his speech, but he was truthful in his speech. He was not rude. He did not see the people on the other side of the fence as his enemy. He saw them as somebody that needed God as he did, and he was there to make that known. And by the way, Daniel, it says here, returned to his house, and he urged his friends to plead for mercy. Put Daniel prayed. We're not going to talk about prayer today. We will later in this series because this is such a staple of Daniel's life. Just a little note here. Think about when you pray. Do you only pray when it gets hot, heavy, and hard? Or do you pray because this is the way you navigate life? Daniel does not pray because he's in an emergency. Daniel prays because that's the way he navigates every bit of life, whether it is good or bad, whether it is difficult or easy. Daniel's way to handle life is always to pray. And so when he comes up against this moment, he's not having to run to pray, and he hasn't done it in a while. This is just the staple of his life, and it really needs to be a staple in our life. And God, in this case, does respond to the prayers of Daniel and his friends, and he begins to unveil the king's dream to Daniel. And let's look at what that dream is up in verse 31 of chapter 2. Daniel goes into the king, and this is what he says to him. He says, your majesty, look, and there before you stood a large statue an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces. They became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock, 
that struck the statue became a huge mountain and it filled the whole earth. So here is the stream, and we got, do we have a picture here? There we go. This, okay, this is a rendition. I don't know if this is exactly what it looked like, but this gives you some idea of what the king had a dream of. This enormous statue, its head is made of gold, its chest and arms are made of silver, its belly and thighs of brass, its legs are iron, and then the toes are a mixture. They're a mixture of iron, and they're a mixture of clay. And I think Nebuchadnezzar remembered the dream. He's thinking, that's exactly what I dreamed. And he allows Daniel to go on and he begins to interpret it. Look at verse 36. He says, this was your dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything." And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Now, this brings us to... um, what is going to be one of a number of what's known as apocalyptic passages in the book of Daniel. It's this foretelling of the future, of what's to come to pass, what's to happen. Now, when it comes to what Daniel is foretelling here, uh, believe me, there's been a lot of ink spilled and a lot of debate that's taken place. It's usually boiled down to two views, and one of them usually comes out on top. And so that's the one we're going to look at today. If you want to know the other one, Come and see me after service. Be glad to to give it to you really quickly. Uh, But pop up that next slide. This will give us some sense of what people think Daniel is interpreting. Uh, Remember what he says in this. He tells the king, what? You're the head of gold. So we know that Babylon is the head of gold. You're, You're at the top right now when it comes to kingdoms and to kings. But he says, you know what? You're not going to be around forever. And there's going to be another kingdom that's going to come after you. If you do a little history, you're going to know that one of the kingdoms that came after Babylon was the Medo-Persian Empire. They will basically do away with Babylon and they will take over. And of course, it gives you the rule there from about 539 to 331. They, They will rule most of the world. And then he reminds us there's a third kingdom coming. Interestingly, he calls it a kingdom of bronze. Uh, Most people think that is Greece. Bronze was the, the, uh, mineral, the element that they used. And uh, if you know a little history, the head of Greece was a guy named Alexander. Uh, By the age of about 31, he had conquered all of the known world, and that includes the Babylonian and the Mede Persian empires. So uh, in fact, it's even recorded that after he conquered all the worlds, he went into his tent and sat down and cried because there was nothing more left to conquer. And not long after that, he was actually... uh, assassinated by his own troops and his kingdom split up. Uh, The last one that Daniel mentions there, this leg of iron, uh, most believe that to be the Roman Empire. Uh, And he speaks here of this as, as something that smashes everything. If you go back and read a little history, Rome is really unlike any other, um, any other empire in history. They were brutal. They conquered anything and everything Uh, And they would rule somewhere in the neighborhood of about 700 
years before they would finally uh, kind of pass off the scene. And then he speaks of the toes. Now, in this one, uh, the idea there is that there's going to be a future empire. Two views of the toes this morning. One is that it just speaks about the demise of the Roman Empire. If you read history, you'll find that Rome over time mixed with other nations. They actually had people from other nations come in and fight with their army. It it didn't end up being all Roman. It became a mixture of people. And that didn't work out very well because some of the people that mixed with them did not have the same loyalties to Rome that Romans had. And little by little, they tended to break down as a nation and die from within. And then they were ultimately conquered from without. By the way, nations die within before they are conquered from without, which is why it's important to be a nation strong within. And others think that in the future, uh, there's actually going to be um, kind of another empire that will rise, run by a guy that we often just call the Antichrist, and somehow uh, these nations will be a part of what was the old Roman Empire. He will rule over them, and for a season, he will rule over over most of the governments and um, kings of the earth after what many people call the rapture and then into the tribulation. Now, which of those about the toes? I don't know, okay? I've got my own thoughts about it, but I really don't know. And here's the thing this morning. When we come to something like this, um, sometimes as Christians, we just, get, we just get caught up and driven by this apocalyptic stuff. You know, and everything that happens, every moment something changes on the news, it's got to be the end of the world. You know, it's got to be something else that's happening. Okay, just a little help here this morning. Uh, We know that the nations mentioned there, at least the the four Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, they did exist. We know that. And uh, they did follow Babylon. And that may well have been what Daniel meant. But here's the point of apocalyptic literature this morning. It is not... It is not to give any of us a play-by-play, detailed book of how every single moment of the world is going to play out and then end. That's, that's not what the apocalyptic literature is about. I'm sorry, that is not what the book of Revelation is about. I know that's how people teach it. I know it is, and they've got it just, I mean, they, they know every single part of it, what it means. Here's the thing. Have you ever noticed how many times... The people that write these books have to go back and revise them like every few years because things change. Yeah, that's because we don't know. Here's the thing this morning. Apocalyptic literature gives us a general big scope of where things are going. But the point of that kind of literature and the point of this picture this morning that's here is to remind us as it would have reminded Daniel that look no matter what it looks like no matter which nation seems to be sitting on the throne no matter how good or how bad the world appears the reminder of apocalyptic literature is this it is that God is still on the throne and the future sets securely and firmly in his hand and if you're a child of God you can rest your head on your pillow at night pretty easy because God's got things taken care of. That's the point of apocalyptic literature. In fact, unfortunately, when you get to Daniel 2, the thing that people gravitate to is the statue, and the point of this isn't the statue. You know what the point of this is? Here's the point of this. It's that right there. It's the stone made without hands. That's the point of the whole dream or vision that this king has. It is this stone. Remember what it does? It strikes the statue at the feet, and what happens? All of that statue just crumbles, and the Bible says it blows away like chaff, and this stone, this rock that is cut out without human hands, it begins to grow and enlarge until it becomes a kingdom that overruns the entire world and never passes away. That's the point of the statue and the dream. It's, it's the rock that we are supposed to focus on and become caught up in. 
And by the way, as theology and revelation progresses through the Bible, and it does, there's things you will read in the Old Testament that become a lot clearer in the New Testament. That's called progressive revelation. It happens in the Bible. Things become more clear. Talk here about a stone, but when you go over into the New Testament, we know who the stone is, don't we? Yeah, because... Jesus tells us who the stone is. In Mark 12, Jesus refers to himself as the stone that the builders rejected. Now, Daniel won't know that when he writes this. He's about five to seven hundred years out from Christ even arriving into this world. But what he's doing is he's speaking about Christ without knowing it. And when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus will begin to remind them that, look, I'm a king. And I've come with a kingdom, but it isn't a kingdom like you're thinking of. Okay, It's a kingdom that starts in people's hearts. And then it's a kingdom that grows and it spreads little by little. That that kingdom started when Jesus came into this world, but that kingdom will come to its fulfillment when he returns to this world. And then it will be a kingdom with a kingdom, a king that rules over all kings and kingdoms of God this earth. Jesus is the stone, and his kingdom is the kingdom that Daniel's mentioning here that will one day grow and spread over the whole earth and take over every king and every single kingdom. See, Nebuchadnezzar was building a kingdom that he planned on lasting for a long time. And Nebuchadnezzar was a man who planned for his name to live for a long, long time. And you know what? Nebuchadnezzar's reign lasted about 70 years. And then Babylon was gone. And today, there's probably not a lot of people that if you said, oh, by the way, do you know who Nebuchadnezzar is? Unless you've been in church a long time, would look and say, probably have no idea who the guy is. He's just been relegated to the the dustbin of history, so to speak. His kingdom wouldn't last. It wasn't meant to. By the way, Daniel tells him this because Daniel wants him to think in a much bigger picture about what's important and what's lasting. But clearly, he does not get the point. Look at verse 46 of Daniel 2. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, and he paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. It's clear the king did not get the point of the message. One is he ends up praising the wrong person. He's down on his knees just offering up praise to Daniel. Uh, Wrong person. Daniel's just the messenger. That's all that he is. He's, He's not really the important figure. It's the God that speaks through him that's the important figure. By the way, God's always the important figure, not people. We're just vessels that God works through. God can always find a new vessel. What's important is that our focus is on God, and that's where Daniel always drives it to. Don't be fooled by what the king says. I know the king sounds really spiritual here. You know, he tells Daniel, oh man, your God is the God of gods, and he's, he's the Lord of lords, and he's the king of kings. He can reveal mysteries. Okay, that sounds great. Um, the man's not converted, okay? Don't, don't buy that. He's not. Uh, you have to understand something about Babylon. Babylon was a polytheistic nation. They collected gods everywhere they went. And, and if your God would help them out for a season, great, we're, we're with your God. It's kind of like people today sometimes, you know, God helps them out, they're with God. And once God isn't really helping them out the way they want to, well, we'll move on to something else that hopefully works. This is the way Nebuchadnezzar is. And so... T- 
Today, Daniel's God seems to come through. His gods don't come through. Man, your God is great. And by the way, chapter 3, we get to chapter 3. Uh, next chapter, remember what Nebuchadnezzar does? Yeah, he goes back out and builds a statue of himself. He loves himself so much. He doesn't get it. He's still thinking about himself. He's still thinking about his kingdom. He's still thinking about his glory. He's still thinking about his greatness. He doesn't get it. Now, here's the thing this morning. Do we get it? Do we get the point that Daniel is showing us here? Now, there is a cosmic side to this dream. It has to do with how nations will play out. Many of them have already come and gone. Is there going to be another? I don't know. Maybe. It's possible. It's possible. But what he does remind us here is eventually all nations, all nations, all kings, all presidents, I don't care who they are, where they're from, where they're at, they're going to bow before the king of kings and his kingdom. That's just how it's going to play out. But there's a personal side to this that I want us to think about this morning. And that is that everybody in this room, everybody, you are laying foundation and you are building something. Everybody laying a foundation and building something. The question is, for all your efforts, for the things that you're pursuing, is it going to be worth it? Is it going to last? Are you investing yourself in what is of worth? Jesus, in what is, uh, at least in the scriptures, his longest and most uh, well-known sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, actually talks about this very thing. And he plugs it in right at the end of his sermon so you will not forget it. You will remember the last things he says. Remember, he tells the story of two men who go out to build houses. And they're not building houses. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is Jesus is taking something that people can understand in everyday life and making a spiritual application. You know, people go out and they build. How good that building is, how well that building will perform and last, is all put together on what they've put it on and the materials they've put into it. And he says, here's the thing. Some people in life, they don't really know the value of things. They miss the value of things. And so they build with things and on foundations that at the end come up short. Others, he says, they think about the foundation they're laying and the building they're making. In the end, it comes out well. And of course, the application to that is, what's the foundation you're building on? And Jesus reminds us, the wise thing to build on is the words that he speaks. So do you build on those this morning? And look, I know we're sitting in a church today and we can be all spiritual. Okay, but let's just be all honest today, okay? Let's forget the spiritual side. Of it. Let's just be honest. I don't think there's hardly any of us in here, particularly if you're a believer, would say, oh no, I think it's important to build on the word of God. But here's my question this morning. Are you? Do you read the Bible? Well, maybe that's just a good question. Do you read the Bible? Do you read it as much as you do your social feeds, watch your news channels? Do you read the Bible? Where do you get the guidance for your life? Where do you get the direction for the decisions that you have to make? When you're facing something, does one of the first thoughts that enter your mind say, I wonder what God has to say about that? 
Or is it when you get to the backside and think, man, I wish I would have thought what God had to say about that. Look, whose kingdom are you building this morning? Some of us build like we're going to live here a million years. You're not. And listen to me this morning. Yes, you need to work. And you need to work hard. There, there are necessary things we all need to do in life. We got bills to pay and kids to take care of and families to care for. I get that. I'm, I'm all for that. And by the way, it's okay to be successful. Do you know that? It's okay to be successful. It's okay to move up the ladder if you can. By all means, go for it. Be ambitious. There's no sin in that. But here's the thing. Do you see your blessings, and your successes as coming from you? Or because God was gracious to help you? Do you recognize where your talents, your brains, your ability, your strength comes from? Are, are your successes and your advances about promoting you? Getting you what you want? building the kingdom of you and me and us? Or do you see your opportunities as not only an opportunity to bless you and bless your family and bless others, but as a means to do just like Daniel did with his? And that was a means to point people and have a greater influence to talk about and speak about the king that really matters and the kingdom that really, really lasts. Listen, there's going to come a day for me, for you, when what we've built on, what we're building is going to just be laid bare. It, it, it's coming. It may come in events that will just simply happen in life, but it will certainly come when all of us stand before the one who is king. And we all will. See, the point to Nebuchadnezzar and the point to you and me is this. If you build your life, if you build your greatness, and you build your kingdom on anything other, Christ, you're going to have a very unsteady and disintegrating structure. It's just a matter of time. It's about thinking about what our foundations are this morning. And it's very easy to get caught up in this culture and get caught up with the immediate and not the important. Get caught up with all kinds of temporal things. And yes, we, yes, we do have to take care of some of those, but we do it to the exclusion of the eternal things altogether. And we take all that we have all that God gives us, and we take it to ourselves instead of realizing all of that isn't for ourselves. It's for others, and it's for Him, and it's for His kingdom too. The poet, by the name of Oscar Wilde, he wrote this of his generation. He said, we know the price of everything and the value of nothing. I think that could be for any generation. I think there's people who always know the price of everything and the value of nothing. We really can become confused about what's important, what matters. I'll take care of that later. I'll do that later. But later never comes. Listen, Christ is the stone. And his kingdom is growing. By the way, did you notice when you looked at the statue, it starts with gold and kind of works its way down. It gets less and less value. And then you get to what? You get to this rock, to a stone. Well, it's less than any of those values in one sense. Because see, this is how the kingdom of God is. The things of God so often don't look like much. They don't sound like much. I mean, who wants to talk about humility and submission and kindness and, and, and coming low 
and, and dying to live. Who wants to go with that in this culture? Not really. See, you look at the kingdom and you think, oh gosh, I really want to give myself to that. But do you notice what he says? That thing that seems so small, that thing that seems so powerless, that thing that seems not worth it, slowly but surely is growing and spreading. And one day, it's going to grow and spread to the point of where the king is going to come and the king is going to establish that kingdom And the values of heaven and the things of heaven, they're going to be the most important thing on this earth. What Daniel challenges us to do is see that now by eyes of faith and orient our life that direction. So which way are you looking this morning? What things are you focused on? What's underneath you? And what are you building for? Father, today, help us to see by eyes of faith your kingdom and your ways because they are not very often extolled and upheld in a fallen world. We value power. We value wealth. We value a name and influence. Very often you call us to humility and to service and to obedience. To die to self and and live to your ways and, and that is just hard. And many times just the busyness of our life and the immediacy of so many things the important, the eternal just kind of gets swept aside and we think I'll get to it later. Father, this morning, would your spirit speak to us? Help us to look deep. What are we really building on? What are we really laying for a foundation underneath our lives? Your words, your truths, what we think is best or maybe what is just most easy and comfortable at the moment. Father, help us to live for what lasts, build for what's eternal. Give us the wisdom on how to do that. I pray that in Jesus today. Amen. As we think about the sermon and how much God had to have loved us in order to leave everything beautiful, everyone worshiping him, condescend to us to give his life. How glorious and how beautiful. Let's sing and thank him and praise him.
have paid our ransom. The question is, have you accepted that gift of payment that he's made for you? If you haven't, I'd love to talk with you today. If you have a need this morning, uh, we're going to have a couple people up here, a lady, gentleman, a couple of us up here. So if you need prayer for something, please uh, come up and do that. Father, this morning, Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to live for the things that are lasting. Uh, Yes, we have things to take care of in this world. Yes, there are things we can enjoy. It's just sometimes we live and we enjoy to the point of it looks like we think this is all there is and it isn't. Uh, Would you help us to be wise about what you give us, how to use it, not only for our families, but for your kingdom and for your glory to go out. And Father, as we step into a new week, And we rub shoulders with a world that does not know you. Uh, May we be reminded that's a world you love. That's a world that you paid the ransom for. And may we interact with it with wisdom and with tact that we may share about this kingdom and this king that lasts forever. Father, I pray that today in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the stone. Amen. Amen. Have a good Sunday. Have a great week. good to us. We want to have you guys over for dinner sometime. That would be great. Uh, we'll be finishing up ball here in these last couple weeks, and then things open up a little bit. Okay. So, yeah, let me get through that one, and then let okay. me know, and we'll do it. Okay. All right.
they took a picture for me because they thought oh. I was like, I don't see anybody there. So <laughs> oh, yeah, right down there, the little yeah. bit you do, yeah. And so they took a picture and they were like, look, here, I still can't, I still can't see it. Oh. And I was like, oh, I have no I idea who that was, but somebody. Why I have so much stuff under my seat. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My wife Michelle. I'll be back over.